The fact that most people don't know is that when we started this picture, I didn't know it, but I found out very quickly. We had a studio that was going out of business. We had a toy company that had just lost $400 million on the He-Man toy line, and we didn't know that either. And so we had two very desperate entities hoping that this picture was going to solve all of their problems. And I had to direct this picture under the most extreme circumstances you could imagine. Every day was a crisis of some kind. And some of those crises were even, we're shutting you down today, this movie's over. And I kept saying, it's not over, we're gonna keep going. Somehow we're gonna get through this, and we did. From a distant galaxy, they have come to Earth. Dolph Lundgren as He-Man, Frank Langella as Skeletor. Only they have the powers to be. Masters of the Universe, live the adventure. About 1986, we started to uh, develop a live action movie. My group, me, an executive by the name of John Weems, went around and talked to a bunch of studios. Universal Studios was interested. And then Canon came to us and, and made an offer and a deal that we felt was uh, the right thing to do at the right time. And Canon worked out this deal with Mattel. The deal was that uh, Canon would put up half the money and Mattel would put up half the money. And Canon told Mattel, okay, you put up the first half. So Mattel put up the first half and we very quickly burned through that money and so Mattel said okay you know time for you to kick in the second half and Ken said no. So Mattel had to pony up the rest of the money if they wanted to see their film made and they were desperate to have it made because they were hanging their next year's toy line on the success of that film and, and generating publicity for their toy line. In the end I think Mattel released them from like a payment that was due that we released them from so that they could finish the film. Mattel had heavy say they had approvals over everything over costumes over the script, everything. We had veto rights more than approval rights. If something was not appropriate for He-Man, we, we could say that. And Mattel is, now listen, you know, um, He-Man can't kill anybody. He-Man can't really hurt anyone, not really. He-Man, it's like, okay guys, like we're making an action movie with an action hero. This is live action film, not a cartoon. So, you know, so one of the reasons we created these generic, you know, everyone said, oh, they copied Star Wars. No, we created generic robot warriors so that He-Man could smash and fight and blast them because he couldn't actually do that to anyone living because that would have been a no-no. At the start of production, He-Man was at his peak. By the time we were about halfway through the movie, the, the decline had started in the toy sales, big time. It just suddenly dropped. And I'll never forget, I'm not gonna tell you the, the executive's names, but uh, I got this call one day and I had said, in an earlier conversation with them, guys, you know, go, go see what action movies are right now. You know, you want to do an action movie, He-Man's got to kick some ass. He's got to really be up there. He's got to, we've got to see him battling, blasting guys, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and so I got a call one day. They said, we have to meet with you right away. They came down to the set and they pulled me in the room. They go, you know, toy sales are down. Everything's on this movie. You got to just, and I said, oh, well, we're doing the best we can. We can, you know, and, but you know, we're also trying to obey all these rules. And one of them goes, we don't care what you do. We don't care what you do. Have him kill people, have him blood, guts, gore, sex, do whatever you have to. Just make sure this movie's a hit. <laughs> it was a low bow budget for us. So we had, we, we didn't have that much money to work with. We had gone on a location scout. It was up in Idaho, this awful lava pit, extraterrestrial looking place with all kinds of caves and, and lava rock formations and everything. They ran out of money so we wound up shooting at Vasquez Rocks. Everybody knows the location so well because they've seen it in so many movies. I sought out Frank Langella to play Skeletor. I knew there was going to be an actor behind a mask. I wanted an actor of, of enough power and, and stature that, that, that his performance would come through that mask. I put a lot of emphasis on Skeletor once I had Frank Langella in the role. I wanted him to carry the picture. I was accepting of the fact that Dolph came with the picture. I was concerned that Dolph would be able to carry the scenes. Uh, he was brand new. He'd, just, he'd only done the Rocky movie. I did my best to, to restructure the story almost through the eyes of Skeletor so that the backbone and spine of the project was carried by Skeletor, and which was fine anyway, because he's the villain, he's, he's pulling all the strings anyway. Frank Langella is a consummate performer. When we all heard that he was going to be playing Skeletor, it was like there isn't anybody else in the world 
that is going to do the job that Frank will do. And that's why really I don't think anybody objected to all the input he put into it because what he pulled in, he was going to give back out again, and he did. In creating Skeletor, I took photographs of Frank Langella. We had already cast Frank as Skeletor and started working over his face, designing uh, the makeup uh, that would go into that. And Frank was very particular about what he thought would work, what he thought wouldn't work, and uh, his ideas were always right on. He was very conscientious about the cloak, for example. It had to move just right. We kept designing and building different cloaks until he got one that, that just moved perfectly. And it was really Frank Langella who made that character come to life. And I also was aware, and I may hate to say this on camera, but I was aware that Dolph, it was his second picture, I wanted to surround him with a good company of actors that would, uh, that would that would keep the screen alive and would also help him to bring his performance up too. I saw the, the rough cuts, I listened to Dolph Rundgren's voice, and I just about had a heart attack. Now why are you so important to Skeletor? I wanted him to uh, redub his voice, get someone else to speak for him. In his contract he had the right to do it two or three more times and he finally got it to where it wasn't too bad. And I, I said, it's okay if He-Man has a little bit of an accent, but you've got to be able to understand him. Right. I was concerned with the, the picture, and I wanted to make the picture the best it could be. We actually brought in a few actors and, and did, did loop as a test uh, to show the studio. One of them was flawless. One, one of them was flawless. I, I mean, to this day, I wish we'd have done it. But uh, Menahem uh, was like, nope, we're going to stick with Dolph. We're going to go with him. You know, it's ultimately their call. Hey, man, if I kill him, I make him a martyr, a saint. Broken. One of the reviewers pointed out that uh, that the villains, meaning Meg and, and Frank, it, to some degree were more compelling characters, that you were more interested in them than the heroes. And to some degree it was true because they both gave, gave great performances and we gave them some great lines, we gave them some great scenes. Oh my God, Kevin, you all right? He's bleeding. What happened? The other interesting casting choice was, you know, we were looking for the lead girl, and uh, we, we got introduced to Courtney Cox, and Courtney Cox had just done the Springsteen video. In fact, that was how she was, this is the girl who's in the Springsteen video. That's how it was so, this is the girl in the Springsteen video. You gotta see her. She was good, but she, I just didn't feel she fit the part, because she had actually done what a love actress would do. She put on a lot of makeup, she wanted to look very sexy, and, but this role was more of an all-American girl. And my casting director actually was the one who said, I want to bring her back in one more time. I want you to look at her one more time. So I have to give credit to, to her as well, Vicki Thomas. So Vicki said, let me bring her back in. And she, she called Courtney and said, ditch the makeup, come in in jeans, just be yourself. Courtney came in the next day in jeans, no makeup, as herself. We got along great. She had such a great personality and she was uh, beautiful. And uh, she just nailed, nailed it that day. And uh, I knew right then, okay, she's the one told Vicki, said, you're right, I'm glad you brought her in again. She was a fine, but she had great natural ability, and she, uh, I think she did a great job. Frank did a great job. I, I uh, very happy with the cast overall. It was a, an extraordinary time to be working for Canon. You have to understand that at this point in time, the most films that any of the major studios had in production was Warner Brothers, and they had six films in production. Canon had 84 films in production. There were three times during the making of the film where literally the payroll didn't arrive that day and the crew was all going to walk and I had to get them all together and say, let's, you're here, let's finish the day. And if at the end of the day there's no money, I understand. But meanwhile, Elliot, Elliot Shook, our producer, he's going to go get the money. So I can't promise you, but I can tell you, we're going to do everything we can. I think we'll have your money by the end of the day. So, you know, you don't hear all these stories in making a movie. What you have to do as a director to, you know, to keep things going. And the guys said, okay, well, you're right. We're here. Let's do it. Let's, let's do the day. So we'd get through the day. And somehow or other, Elliot would get to Canon, and somehow they would find the money, and they would get their payroll, and we kept going. So Canon was really pressuring Gary, and, and they decided to pull the plug. They didn't want to do the, the huge battle sequence at the end in the, in the set. Yeah, they shut me down on the set in the middle of the battle. And I mean, literally, with someone uh, picking up a card and putting it in front of the camera and saying, you're done. I mean, in the middle of a shot. So that was kind of crazy. And I said, you know, we don't have the end. There's no, I mean, we don't have the final conference. We have the setup. We did the clash. We had the moment where uh, He-Man and Skeletor clashed with the sword, right? And on the set that day, I had an idea, um, which was, because uh, I knew we were running short on time, and I knew they might do this to me. So I had them do that clash once, and I, and I told the DP, um, I want you to 
I want you to pull, you know, basically kill the lights in the soundstage and just let them fade to darkness because if I'm not able to finish this battle, um, then I'm going to do a thing. I'd thought through that when they go, the power is so much that it like saps the power from everything and then we're in this dark void and that's where I can do whatever I got to do to get us to the end. So that night I got them to let me do some random battle footage. Even though we shut down the set, I kept Skeletor and Dolph and the DP and this and I got them to let me shoot some footage of them battling. And it wasn't very well choreographed. It was a very quick choreographic job. We kept the lights out, we backlit them, which is what you see in the film. And we had everything now, so I had enough that I could piece together the battle, but we did not have the end. That moment where he hits the sword, it slides, he reaches for it, grabs it, all that, all that last bit, none of that was shot. I said, okay, well, let's, I guess if we're done, we're done, and we're gonna have to come back and get this other stuff. It was a shame because I had really designed that set for sword fighting. I made sure that there were ups and downs and overs and unders in all kinds of ways it could be used uh, to, to get the most out of this battle. We came back about uh, three or four months later and we got one day, kind of gave me one day at the boss studio and we boarded it very carefully and every single shot, every cut, every close up, everything you see there was all done in one day and we got it and uh, we were able to put the ending on the, on the movie. It was very, very, very touch and go. And at one point, the Canon guys, you know, go on global. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're just, you know, they'll fight. They'll just fight, and, and then we'll just, we'll fade out. I was like, <laughs> you, you can't fade out. <laughs>